Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. In the love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Janavi Pandya is one of those uh, rare people who are uh, as bright as they are conscientious and uh, start showing their uh, awareness of uh, being indebted to the divine for all that they have received to such an extent that they want to immediately give back something to those who are not so privileged. Struck by a child her own age when she was herself a child, uh, finding the contrast between her comfortable existence and this child beggar, uh, she had this image with her, it seems uh, uh, all along. And as soon as she was an undergraduate in psychology, although it was not, a, not uh, by any means the requirements of the course, she thought that she should start using her uh, whatever little psychology she had learned to uh, do something for others, especially youngsters. And uh, that's how she started reaching out schools. She started reaching an, out orphanages. And uh, uh, then uh, being a young person, she was very tech savvy and uh, she made full use of the YouTube to reach out to many more, especially youngsters going through examination stress and career related stress uh, through her videos. And uh, her videos became extremely successful. It seems they touched a chord somewhere or because of the consciousness that went behind that. So we had this privilege of uh, having her here in the ashram uh, in June. Uh, and uh, we recorded uh, two of her sessions. One of those sessions was a conversation uh, to bring out a little more of uh, what uh, made her uh, choose this uh, unusual sort of uh, path, uh, what made her do all these things which uh, people her, at her age uh, commonly don't think of, and how she has been able to combine this with an extremely glorious academic career. So with this background, what we'll do is we'll play the recording uh, that was done while she was here, and uh, I hope she will be soon here to join us in this session also, so that at the end of the session, she can answer some uh, uh, questions and answers. She's already there. I can see her, and I'll make her the co-host and also play the recording. It'll take a while to switch from this mode to the recording mode. So please bear with us. Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. Welcome to this edition of uh, Yes Dialogues. My name is Ramesh Pijlani, and I have with me a bright young psychologist, Janavi Pandya, who has been uh, doing a PhD in psychology at the University of Iowa for the last one year. She's on a short visit to India, and uh, I thought I'll take this opportunity to discuss with her certain issues which are of general interest, particularly to the youth of this country. Before I do that, 11 blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Delhi branch, where I live and work. I met Janvi for the first time uh, in 2018, isn't it? 2018, where I had gone for a conference uh, at the college where she was doing her undergraduate studies in psychology, Xavier's College. And as I said, quite often what happens in the sessions in the conferences is less important than what happens outside the sessions. And that is where I discovered Janvi. Uh, we were having dinner around the same table in the evening after the day's proceedings were over. And uh, I discovered that uh, she was uh, somebody special. What attracted me and what has uh, stayed in my memory uh, from there is uh, that uh, she sang a few verses of the Gita translated into English and uh, in the form of verse and she sang them. She has a beautiful voice. Yanni, would you like to sing one of those uh, now? Okay. Uh, one of them was Being given praise and blame Being given honor and fame This is the explanation of equanimity. 
equal in insult and praise and the yeah so equal in uh, pain and pleasure equal in earth stone and gold's measure basically being even in praise and blame being even in honor and praise so that was uh, something which uh, made me feel that she is something else and uh, fortunately by god's grace we have stayed in touch she went on after that to do her postgraduate studies a masters in counseling psychology at sndt university in mumbai and uh, for the last one year she has been doing a phd at the university of iowa so if i may start i mean uh, i have learned quite a bit about her in these uh, few years the four years that i have known her she got attracted to the geeta in fact at the age of 13 and uh, this is something which uh, is more impressive than one may think because i have seen there are so many adults in our country who have never read the geeta so at the young age of 13 to get attracted to the geeta uh, and take so much interest that before she was 25 she had uh, translated it translated so many verses into english and sang them and that of course is understandable because she comes from a family full of musicians uh, so uh, the music is in her blood and god has blessed us with a blessed her with a beautiful voice but all the same to be drawn to the geeta at such an early age is itself something uh, which uh, is unique and probably speaks of the sanskars that she brought from her previous lives. Uh, so uh, if I may ask her to share with us how she got drawn to the Gita at such an early age. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I think I was, I always enjoyed being introspective. So um, even in school, I preferred doing sports. A lot of school, uh, students were drawn to sports where they would make good friends or where most people would go. I was drawn to a place where I would have to think or be within myself um, and one of the sports was archery uh, and at that time to also work with uh, the challenges that uh, the sports um, field brought at that time i started reading books and one of the favorite person and one of the person that i read a lot was uh, mahatma gandhi and uh, he wrote a book on the discourses of gita and that was very fascinating and i thought that even i should try to read the gita so i went and asked my father and he told me he had a friend who was an expert on gita so he took me to him and that person just scared me he said you cannot read it on your own don't even attempt to do it otherwise you will mis misinterpret it so he sent me to this maharaj saint somewhere far my father came to drop me and then it was a two hour session, but I was not allowed to be in the session because I was 13 at that time. And uh, he said that you're too young, you can't, you can't understand it and you can't sit in the session. So since my father already dropped me, I was waiting outside that place and thinking about it and got back home and I asked my father, I was like, can I not read it on my own? Why can't I read it right now? And I don't want to wait till I'm like 35, 40. So he said, why can't you just start reading it? So I would read it and not understand, like not draw two connections. I would understand one verse, the next verse, but not understand the connection. So every time I would walk back from school, I would think about the verses and how, what it meant and what is the connection. And one fine day I thought that, oh, I, I got like a summary, a, a flow chart in my head. But oh, this is what it is trying to say, like the first part is speaking about gunas and guna, guna and the other one is about how to get yoga as a way to get to guna and what is guna and uh, yeah and then it was very fascinating in fact a lot of questions about stress anxiety fear anger a lot of the answers were in the gita which was very fascinating gita did have a very uh, in, sort of tremendous influence on mahatma gandhi and uh, it's interesting how this influence multiplies. So it influenced Mahatma Gandhi, and then you read Gandhiji, and that further attracted you to the Gita. And uh, then you know it's also interesting that some people, in fact, discouraged you. They felt that you're too young to study the Gita. Yeah. Well, at any age, we are uh, too young to study the Gita, and that's why we have to not just read it, but also reread it. And every time we read it, we get something more. Yeah. But then. Uh, 
no matter what your age, if you read it, it can't do any harm. And as you discovered, not only didn't do you any harm, but uh, you also found answers to so many common problems like fear and anxiety and anger and so on, how to deal with them. Answers to such very practical questions also you discovered in the Gita and then probably you thought that uh, other young people should also learn about it and probably not many pe young people are at home with uh, the original in Sanskrit. You started translating some of the verses into English and then started singing them. Yeah. Yeah. Then you know uh, you joined uh, the undergraduate course in psychology at Xavier's College. But then during those three years you did so much which was not strictly necessary for uh, studying the course. Uh, you approached so many schools, went there, talked to the children and became a YouTuber and so on. Would you like to share some of those experiences? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, my, the first vivid memory that I have was when I was five years old and someone offered chocolates to my cousin brother and me and he was four, I was five. Um, and then my parents explained that don't take chocolates or don't eat uh, chocolates in front of strangers. And then they explained the concept of getting kidnapped and how kids are getting kidnapped. And that was on my mind. And the next time I went out with my father on the scooty, I saw this little girl who was exactly my height and my size. So for me, I did not have a very good understanding of age at that time. And I couldn't believe how I asked my father, where are her parents? Because somewhere in my mind, I was concerned about her. Well, what if she was kidnapped? What if and why she even if she was not kidnapped, maybe what what made her different than me that I was born in a family where I was sitting on a scooty behind my father, sometimes asking, demanding for toys uh, and feeling upset, not getting to play. Uh, whereas the other girl was selling toys on the, she was not playing with them, she was selling them. Um, and my, I asked my father, where are her parents? And he said, yeah, they must be somewhere there behind the signal. And then the signal was was green. So we went on and I couldn't find her parents. And that that affected me a lot. And I was, and then I kept asking so many questions and at first I was within myself and then my parents noticed something was off. I fell sick, I had high fever and when they talked with me, they realized that I've been thinking about this girl so much. And that is when I decided that I want to do something for, I will make them my friends, I will give them my toys. That was my dream at that time. So when I came to St. Xavier's College, they had a social involvement program, uh, which allowed us to go to any NGO that we would like. and. Um, so I was, I selected an orphanage near my house where I wanted to teach them. But the more I got involved with it, I realized that there is so much that can be done. And what I was giving I and mean, what I was getting was a lot more than what I was giving. I was getting happiness. I was getting peace. I was getting Anand, not Sukh. This Sukh also has this opposite of Dukh. But I was, it reminded me of my blessings every day at the same time. I was just giving them two hours of my day, but I was getting so much, so much more uh, in return. So then I took it further and I decided because stress management was a real thing. I learned when I was in the 10th grade, I had learned that uh, more than 250 ch people die per day by suicide, completing suicide in India, which was very disturbing to me because I feel like what is it that forces someone to take their own life? I mean, it's almost it's so hard like it's so hard to even hurt yourself or harm yourself you get hurt someday you really are in pain and how is it possible to just kill yourself um that drew me towards and then i learned about stress relationship issues and issues that youth um my age were going through and um that drew me towards making youtube videos only about it was just simple uh, with no intention of being anything, but just about how is it that i learned coping with stress or anxiety. What is that I, I do myself? And one fine day when I was in Xavier's first year, one of my videos overnight got some views and like within a span of one month, it got one lakh views. And people started asking more questions. Can you tell us more about this? Can you tell us more about that? And all I did was what I was learning, I started sharing it with people while I was on the way. I, if I learned something new, I discovered something new, I would just, I read something, I would just put it out there. And that's why and now it has reached almost 22,000 subscribers and crossed 20 lakh views in total um, on the channel. Great. That's really great. Uh, 
So you have been doing all this uh, besides uh, doing your uh, graduation and then your master's studies. And still in academics, you were at the top. How could you manage both? I think uh, that's a great question. But I would say that, uh, how did you do this? I'm, my, for me, I, I, my understanding is that I was able to be on the top because I was doing this, not um, because it's, you know, if you're only focused on, oh my God, I have to study all day, then your day begins with, okay, it's nine o'clock. Okay, let's just eat something, drink something. Procrastination goes on. That happens with me also. Um, but when I noticed that I, I knew that I had to go in the evening and teach for two hours at the orphanage, I had to make sure that I finished my portion for my education by four o'clock. So thanks to them that I had to, I had responsibility over there that I would start and it, I would just feel relaxed um, because somewhere in the back of my mind, my academics was not the only way I, you know, and I did not put my identity and my worth on academics. I my identity was a lot beyond that, thanks to a lot of involvement that I had with kids uh, and in social work. So my, yeah, my identity was not contingent on academic success. So I was able to study for the love of education. I truly enjoyed each moment. Uh, and also Gita Shlok Karma Neva Dikaraste Ma Phale Shukadachana Ma Karma Phale Turma Ate Karma really made a difference because I felt like I would focus on my karma only without thinking about the results and the results just followed. And I was not a child who grew up to be a class topper from the beginning. It, it became after ninth grade. From ninth grade onwards, because I started getting involved socially, I would come home, I want to study more. I wanted to study more so I could apply that in the people I meet and the students I meet. So it became intertwined and that motivated me because I was out there and I'm like, I don't want to be in a situation where I am faced with a client and and I'd be like, oh, I skipped that part uh, in my education, so I'm not, I can't counsel. Like, oh, you have grief. Oh, I didn't do the grief chapter, so I can't mm -hmm. work with you. So for you, psychology was not just an academic discipline. It was something that you were actually living yeah. while you were working, and you were working because you loved that work. Yeah. It came from a deeper level, you know, where you wanted to reach out to people who were less privileged than you. And that is what you talked about also in your uh, best student uh, address, you know, at the uh, degree award ceremony at, during graduation, I remember. Yeah. But it's a sort of an obligation for those of us who are more privileged and are able to come to colleges to do something for those for whom it is impossible because of uh, various uh, economic conditions. Yeah. So I... that is uh, what, uh, uh, so that is, uh, is something which, uh, you know, it shows that uh, if you, your intentions are good, mm -hmm. then uh, the divine also takes care of you. And uh, although we keep talking so much about our system of education, that it requires rote learning and uh, doesn't really test what you should be knowing and so on and so forth. But then the fact that uh, just by living the type of knowledge that you are expected to have, you could do so well in the exams, which means that the questions asked were such and the examiners were such that they appreciated the answers which came from your living that experience rather than from uh, rote memory in which you had just mugged up something from textbooks. So that does speak quite uh, well also for the type of uh, education, the type of questions we ask in exams and the way examiners evaluate those answer sheets. Yeah. Really, uh, sort of, that is something very important that comes out of this. And uh, Again, you know, uh, you in a way forgot yourself and in that, that is the best way to discover yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you discover yourself, you also discover that you are not really separate from the others. You discover also that oneness with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, uh, you in fact found at a very early stage in life, the key to ultimate happiness, giving what you had in you to those who needed it without bothering about what you are getting out of it. Mm -hmm. And that is what is the root of all ananda as you said so beautifully that uh, it's ananda not uh, sukha and dukha joy and sorrow which are a part of the dualities which have opposites ananda has no opposite yeah it is just self-existent the light of the divine yeah. thank you yeah now as a part of your work in orphanages schools colleges and uh, so on you also interacted with a very large number of youngsters teenagers and uh, they 
I mean, the teenage in any case is a very turbulent phase of life. We always had problems, but in today's world, those problems uh, seem to have multiplied for various reasons. And we have so much about uh, suicides among the young and at the root. Sometimes it is academic pressure. Sometimes it's relationship issues. Sometimes it is not getting along well with parents. Sometimes peer pressure, getting bullied by your own age group. Well, these are some of some of the problems which uh, are driving some uh, young children to suicide, ending precious lives which had so much potential. And uh, suicides may be only the tip of the iceberg. For each child who commits suicide, there may be many more who just go into a depression mm -hmm. and uh, finding it difficult to come out of it and therefore not able to really do anything because nothing seems interesting to them. Mm -hmm. So would you like to talk about uh, uh, some of these issues which young people face and how you have been helping people, uh, helping youngsters cope with these issues directly by interacting with them through the YouTube and by forming various types of support groups also. I know you have done that too. So that now you know who are the other people whom to test them with, put them in touch with so that they can get what they are really looking for. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very important issue in today's time with the youth. And I have been observing as a teenager or as a youth myself, observed it over a period of time, then studied psychology, that time I was observing then worked as a psychologist for a year and now again experiencing it as a student of uh, a PhD student in America. Um, and I, throughout this, uh, like you mentioned, and so it was also mentioned by one of my professors that for several decades, the causes of suicide have been pretty much similar. But now there is this added component. And now recently also there was a there was an article published which was which showed that the suicide rates have increased more than ever before. I think uh, one thing that I've observed a lot is um, there is some sort of guilt. Um, now I call it the Indian guilt. <laughs> that is something that I notice very uh, specifically to the Indian clients that I work with, Indian students that I work with, is this um, feeling where a lot of times when parents, um, for students, they might feel like, oh, my parents are doing so much for me. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. And then there is social media, which has come up where you see uh, stories on Instagram of people who are living the life. Um, they are, people are posting about their successes, but we forget that nobody posts about their failures or challenging times. So there is a sort of a feeling that everybody around me is doing well. I am not doing well, uh, or I'm feeling hopeless. Another thing is also with media, there is a lot of dissonance that has come with expectations of Indian parents with the students. So now, very quickly, the Ameri a lot of the American culture is coming to India where live-in relationships or relationships are becoming common among youth. Um, but then there is this guilt that comes with it because like, unlike America, this is not acceptable in society. In the same way, academically, now there is more autonomy. Students want to be more autonomous in what they want to choose. There is more awareness, there's more information. They know that this is what happens and this is also a possibility. Uh, through media, they're aware of that, but maybe the values, so there is this, I think we are in a phase, in a transitioning phase where the youth is becoming, uh, is changing very quickly as compared to, like I think the generation now is changing very, very quickly, maybe in two years and parental expectations remain the same. So somewhere deep inside, there is that dissonance, which is a very natural process of change, uh, which, is, which is understandable. And I think we need to give ourselves that grace. And another thing is there's more isolation. There is more connection online, but sometimes more isolation within. Um, and there is like a virtual image that you have of other people. And what we see a lot of times is the virtual world is not the real world. So, people's worth are based on how many likes or how many grades or and because now all of that is out there in public oh this person got a scholarship oh this person got that oh this person and then there's this direct comparison so there is a more sense of easier like people feel worthless more easily because that's what you're seeing around um and at the same time because phone is a good way of distracting yourself instead of working with the problem it's easy to distract yourself. So I think 
these are the major issues which are also contributing uh, in today's time that's from my understanding uh, so far and then it's just becoming students are dealing with it alone that's the problem if there is a relationship breakup because the student is not told their parents about the relationship in the first place they can't talk about the grievances of the breakup or if there is a lower grade there is this inherent guilt that i am not good enough or worth self like your worth self worth is contingent on these numbers or marks or grades uh, which is and then not talking about it you deal with it alone which is why there's a um, major rise and there's a great contribution to number of suicides and depression so it's of defining yourself or measuring your self worth in terms of academic performance which is a very poor and limited way of doing it that is one major reason which comes out and uh, relationship issues relationships are always difficult mm -hmm. and uh, especially when uh, uh, they are uh, not in keeping with the norms of the society mm -hmm. and therefore the child has nobody to turn to yeah. nobody to share those things with mm -hmm. so i think uh, one of the things that uh, these youngsters found was that at least you were available to share uh, someone with whom they could share these things so would you like to uh, talk a little more about uh, how this sharing you have been doing because the sharing uh, the griefs of or the uh, difficult phases of life of so many thousands of students is also so difficult for one person but yet uh, you have sort of found ways of multiplying uh, your reach how could you do that <laughs> that's a great question i think it just for me i um, i feel very i'm very grateful i am when someone comes and shares especially if it's a student that i've worked a lot with students um and when they come and share so much with so much vulnerability i think there is a lot of courage in vulnerability uh because it's not easy to come and tell your therapist that um i think i am i'm worthless or i am i'm no i'm of no use or my parents did so much for me i did no good um so for me it was that gratitude at the same time when i was studying psychology i did not want to be a skilled person or skilled laborer i wanted to apply that to my own life and i it helped me i i like looking inwards and this helped me get deeper within myself so if i do it for myself and i was able to do it within me i have hope that i can do it um, or i can help facilitate the process for others to do it for themselves um, and that was very very helpful uh, to to constantly introspect within in the beginning when i remember i just completed my masters and it was a very hopeless case and it would really bother me a lot like for example one case was this one child who had cancer who was blind small child 2 years old doesn't know what's happening blind you can't even explain to them so the only thing that the child knew was that as soon as the mother is away the child would start crying because the child would get scared that the chemo the child would be in pain after that the mother was from a very poor family she was left by her husband she was the only caregiver of this child living on the streets in some ngo gave them shelter and i just felt so hopeless i feel like what can i even do to talk to her like i was counseling the mother and i just felt like i don't think i can do anything at all uh, what is it that i could even offer like i can't even offer a space where she could at least feel lighter or better but then eventually i learned that you know if a, you're a doctor <laughs> if a doctor starts crying oh my god this was an emergency this person got an accident that person the doctor will not be able to operate that person so then there was more reflection more meditation more self awareness and that because my intent then i focused on my intentions and my intention was to make a difference to facilitate that process so i started looking inwards and started focusing more on my intentions rather than my um, emotions um, and that's how when i worked with the youth it i was be able to be objective and was able to detach myself from detachment in terms of the geetha detachment or the english understanding of detachment but um, that was really helpful of me being able to keep my like to be able to regulate my emotions in that moment so love without attachment yes 
that sort of thing. I think I think that helped, and eventually, as people would ask questions and started speaking about it, I have made no efforts to reach out to thousands of people, but it's people who share it with other people, and that's how it helped. Uh, one more thing that you shared with me some time back, maybe I can share with the, those who are watching this program, uh, that uh, in the US, if you have to counsel somebody, you have to be properly registered, not only past exams, but also with that particular state, you should have a certif certification from that state and so on and so forth. So it's a tightly regulated profession, counseling. In India, it is rather uh, loose. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, you appreciated what the type of uh, flexibility that we have in India, deliberately leaving it a little unregulated. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to talk a little more about that? Yeah, I think, how it helps. I think for me, obviously, I, I could not work as a counselor or work, uh, to do any internships as a counselor. And my focus as a student was never to have more number of internships under my in my resume. In fact, I was a student who was who do not have those kinds of experience which typical typically good students or what they call i mean yeah so that was but then i was like i just want to learn more and uh because india has so much need and i feel like th there was a lot of freedom identity that i could create on my own in this country because um i wanted to go out there because i was studying psychology and I wanted to see how it works in real life. So when I was going to the orphanage, although I was just teaching the students over there as a volunteer, um, I didn't have to get registered or go through any uh, major paperwork or any, anything like that. I could just go in an organization, speak with children. I went to 60 schools. I would just contact the schools, say that, hey, I have something about stress management. And I would just tell them briefly about this is what it is. And some techniques of studying uh, because we, we are taught what to study not how to study so i wanted to focus on that and people will be like yeah just come over and do a session for two hours on the spot so that's spontaneity and at the same time that that i i think i had like a vast scope wherever i put my finger i could get in there it was limited by my own uh by by my own my myself because i decided okay i want to go and teach in an orphanage go to any nearby orphanage did that Went to another place went to cancer center could do that if nothing i would go on cancer streets in tata uh, which is in mumbai opposite tata hospital because tata hospital gives free cancer treatment to people and um as a master's student i was allowed to get any amount of internship experience i wanted so this was voluntary and i would just go right outside the streets and sit with them sit on the streets literally and do counseling for people over there so the world was a playground i felt it was just wonderful because they had the need and i was curious to learn and i think that opportunity helped me learn so much more i was able to work in the jail i was able to work with mumbai police work with children in conflict with law with children of prisoners it was it was just a wonderful experience which i think i wouldn't have got in any other country but in that's really great and uh... Uh, I would uh, sort of support you wholeheartedly in uh, uh, this uh, feeling because after all, what is counseling? Counseling is just one human being helping another go through a difficult phase of life with minimum pain and maximum growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, all what that requires is uh, a good intention. Maybe a little amount of wisdom, but more than that, being a patient listener, empathy. These are the things which are at the core of uh, all therapies and uh, as you have been uh, doing and perhaps would see that uh, instead of thinking in terms of uh, which type of therapy would be most suitable for this person uh, you just looked at the person as a whole uh, not only on the surface but as deep as you could go into that person and felt one with that person and then felt what is it that i can do this for this person and that is what has been uh, well it has made your counseling so effective and especially, I mean, with the limited manpower, with such a small number of clinical psychologists and psychiatrists in the country, it is good that the system is uh, not tightly regulated. And uh, uh, in fact, that is a part of our culture. Our social support systems have not been centered on professionals, but around the family and friends. Mm -hmm. While, I mean, that support is weakening, it is good that this type of informal uh, support 
which well-meaning persons like you can bring to those in distress also continues. And for that, uh, qualifications on paper really are not that important. What is important is uh, their uh, genuine desire to help somebody going through a difficult phase of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely agree. And I think through YouTube, I've also found inspiring youth. I get inspired from them is when they say, they send me a message saying that I want to do something. Can you, so I direct, for example, someone says, I want to teach someone. And there are a number of students over there who are not so privileged and who would benefit a lot from personal guidance because sometimes our structures may not, they don't, may not have the best uh, resources available to them for uh, getting a good education. But if someone is there to support or just teach, what that child is getting out of teaching is a lot, but what the person who's teaching is getting is also a lot, is the experience that they get. In the, and that can be very well integrated with the education that we take here. Yeah. Well, we talked about uh, all the depressing things mm -hmm. amongst the youth, uh, how they are going through a difficult phase of life and this, sometimes not finding enough support in the society and uh, that is leading to depression and suicides and so on. Let's turn to the other brighter side of the youth, which is also true and has always been true. The youth have a lot of courage and idealism, and I'm sure that still continues to be there. And uh, in fact, we should be seeing more and more of it now, because uh, Shirobindo and the mother, in fact, have talked a lot about the, the world becoming a much a better place to live in in the very near future. Mm -hmm. And that would happen because of the evolutionary thrust there is a strong evolutionary thrust in favor of a rise in consciousness, which in turn would change human nature. And this naturally would affect the younger generation more than the older generations. And uh, the children who are being born today, those who are still young, they are the people amongst whom we'll find a greater proportion of uh, persons like you who would have this type of courage and idealism and would make some efforts and do something concrete to make this world a better place to live in. Of course, you are one of them, but in general, do you find there is some sort of a phenomenon, phenomenon like that in progress all over the world? I think so. Although I've, I don't have as much experience as you do with working with youth, uh, but from what I understand, from the, trying to understand the experiences in the past and from what I'm seeing right now, is I feel like the reason, there's also one reason why I love working with the youth is they are, they are moldable. Um, when I worked in uh, the juvenile observation home, um, I could see changes even, so I feel like a lot of times, um, it's, it's very easy to compare that someone who's doing, oh, look at this person, he, this person is doing a fully funded PhD abroad. Or oh, look at this person, this person cracked a medical. Oh, look at this person, it's, this person is in IIT. Um, it's very easy to compare because, but I feel like the youth, most of them have that potential to be in the places they want to be. It's just that there are a lot of other factors, not necessarily academic factors, but around them uh, that can also contribute to uh, not being able to reach where they truly want to. But uh, from what I notice in today's youth is that there is this willingness um, and there is eagerness for, firstly, for connection, for knowing themselves. And I love when I work with clients, I love focusing on identity, building their own sense of who they are, who am I, and not dependent on, oh, I am a, this professional. Um, but I feel like there is a lot of willingness. And even in cases where there is a lot of hopelessness with someone who has suicidal ideation, the minute they decide to come to therapy, I feel like there is that spark of hope and something that they've not received probably before in a way that they wanted, if they get that, and if they get that opportunity to, or that sort of support, I personally have also seen tremendous amount of change. I've seen tremendous amount. I've seen children who are into crime, suddenly getting into education, focusing on academics. So if, or I've seen children who've say had physical, uh, uh, disorders which are not curable, terminal illnesses, them making use of their, instead of giving up and losing hope, using that 
positively to inspire and influence other people if they had that sort of um, support just to facilitate so i feel like the youth just need some support there is a need to they, there is a need for connection that is missing in today's time and there are these students who are sent with a lot of complaints that this person will never show up they, this person will not even show up for your therapy is always absent bunking don't know where they are they keep going out drinking here and there and still you notice that they keep coming for every session of therapy because they value connection and they need that sort of and if that space is provided if that facility if that is facilitated for them i think the world can be just a beautiful place to be so there's a lot of hope as you said and uh, i also observed that amongst the young people today they are not only looking for a career of course career is important but then apart from that they're also looking for a career which will give them a sense of fulfillment mm -hmm. And if they find that that is not happening, they are switching jobs, they are making transitions from one type of career to another, accepting salary cuts if necessary to do that. But they're not just looking for a comfortable life with a good pay package and all the sensory pleasures. They want satisfaction at a deeper level, a sense of fulfillment and a life which is purposeful and meaningful. That is becoming more and more common. And this is uh, what the hope for the future is about and uh, there can be no better example or a model to inspire more and more youngsters to think more positively creatively and make use of whatever they get in life in the best possible way because everybody can't be in an iit or do an mba and be in the corporate sector getting a, a fat pay package mm -hmm. that is neither uh, uh, possible for everyone nor is it really necessary for being a happy and fulfilled person yeah. So uh, this message, uh, I'm sure, uh, through you will go out to a lot of youngsters and uh, this interaction would inspire many more towards a more purposeful and meaningful life, life which would be precious for themselves as well as for others. It all depends on what sort of an aim we adopt in life. You know, as the mother has said, uh, we should all have an aim in life, of course, because an aimless life is a miserable life. And then she goes on to say that on the quality of your aim will depend the quality of your life. Mm -hmm. And what should be the quality of the aim? What is that high quality aim? The aim should be high and wide, generous and disinterested. Wow. And that is exactly what uh, your life exemplifies. And if any principle has to be uh, communicated properly, it should fit into the life of a person. And that is what uh, this interaction has ended up doing. We have been able to fit this uh, idea of a high and wide, generous and wide, generous and disinterested aim as the aim of life, bringing so much to others as well as so much of a fulfillment, sense of ananda to you. Thank you. And I want to say that this um, the journey that I was on to discover myself, to form that identity, who am I? Um, you have played a very, very important role in that. Um, you, it wouldn't have been the same. So I think a lot that I'm able to give back comes from you directly. And I'm grateful that I had that source of wisdom, that source of experience, and that source of support that I had from you uh, to be able to further this work and send it. And I remember when I asked you long back because I had not known you was, you were just a person I was just admiring and too scared to even come and say that I admire you. Uh, but the amount of support that you came and I, I just asked you, how do I give back to you? And he, you said, pass it forward. So I think that inspires me and it will continue. The work that you do and the person that you are will continue to inspire me and the work I do for the rest of my life. Well, it's just God's grace because uh, uh, these things are not designed uh, through our planning. Uh, the fact that um, we ended up being at the same dinner table at the end of the day in that conference is something which uh, we could not have planned. And then from one thing followed another. And uh, that's how I became that instrument, which probably has been able to give something that I received, pass it on to you. And I said, you keep passing it forwards as you have been doing in such a large measure all your life. Because... Uh, uh, you could have gone in for anything. Uh, before you were 10, you were in archery and uh, reached the national level. Mm -hmm. 
Then in music, again, you have been very proficient. As a psychologist, you had so many options, but you ended up choosing counseling psychology so that uh, you can help those going through mental distress. Because a psychologist can also go into the field of advertising. Mm -hmm. It should be such a contrast with uh, what you have been doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, once again, I mean, uh, thank you for uh, sharing your life, which is so inspiring with, with everybody. And uh, I think the best way we can end is with a few more verses from the Gita mm -hmm. uh, in English. Thank you. Yes. So um, this this one is um, is in Rag Darbari. So Rag Darbari is pretty good for meditation. And there is some research over there which speaks about the tuning of this aligning with the chakras of the body. Um, yeah. Sadhani Pamapagamari Sa The best way to be free is dedicate your action to me. Preach me, I am your Lord. Forget the hope of reward so it is about dedicate your action if you if you believe in god then dedicate it to god if you believe in the divine to the divine if you believe in nature dedicate it to nature but dedicate your um, actions without the hope of reward and and i think that's the that's the way i deal with also deal with anxiety because i've not had any anxiety ever before an exam because or like when i applied to the us um it was a it's it's not something that i was not sure if i would get in or not but i was not worried about it at all i applied and i kept in if i get in i go if i don't get in i stay here it was just normal so i think it has helped me personally and that's why i speak about it for the youth thank you janvi once again for sharing all these inspiring facets of your life you. uh, and i'm sure there will be a lot more that is within you which you could share and we'll leave that for another occasion Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all those wonderful questions and for your presence in my life. I am open to any questions. Janvi has just joined us from uh, Iowa, and uh, as she said, she'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Aditi, why don't you also switch on your video and? Uh, uh, maybe you can ask some questions. I just uh, was just curious what is behind the screen. I see a kind of a map and I was kind of relating it to like how you were speaking about your journey. So I was just wondering if you also think like that and that represents a sense of movement in your life. So just if you can speak about the movement and how you see progress in life in all aspects yeah thanks no it's it's actually a road map that i've made um to for what all goes on in my mind and what i want to do in the next four five years so and then it, it's a reminder of i i like to connect different things from different disciplines different experiences so i make all of those connections. I make those bridges. I've written about music, about experiences that I got from literature, from um, from social work and archery. And how does that relate to me right now as a person, as a future therapist, as a, yeah, in, 
so that's that's my imagination and what i want it just is a reminder of what i want to continue to do in the world um i want to make a difference because it's just easy to get lost in everyday life with all the things that we have to do and then the purpose gets forgotten so for me i think uh, reminding that uh, reminding myself of the purpose is very important and progress i think is also a journey to me again like success progress these things are more of um more inward than outward not like external um things that you achieve but more of how much you're able to know be aware of yourself and become the best version of yourself like abraham maslow spoke about self actualization i think that to me is progress becoming the closest uh, or the best version of yourself and on the journey of that so i just draw it out yeah thanks that's a it's an observation uh, yeah just one more thing you spoke a lot about uh, youngsters so what mm-hmm. have you observed which the adults in their life should take notice of and should uh, take that as account for having conversations with youngsters so what is your message to the adults in life of teenagers yeah that's a great question i think listen uh i mean there's a lot of imposing of perspectives or old ways that this is how it is supposed to be and this is how it is um i think that is what is the most challenging for teenagers because uh they are making their own identity they are trying to be new people that's the that's the age where they are forming their own sense of self and in that it's very important to let them have their own opinions and thoughts and their own desires if they want to study something sometimes just listen to them and hear why they want to do it rather than trying to impose it i've had clients in india who for example i thought could have been great sociologists anthropologists great uh, psychologists but parents just would want them to do engineering and i could tell that they would not be good engineers um so i think but if the parents would have heard them the way a therapist did or um i think it would it would give them that trust that yeah my child is serious about studying what they want to and would allow the child to do what they truly want and build their own sense of identity but if that is crushed then that sense of self just goes away and then that sense of identity may not be as well developed as it is in other uh, people who might succeed in what they want to do yeah thank you Yeah, thanks. Sorry, you're muted. Aditi, any questions in the chat box? No. Mm-hmm. Well, if there are no more questions, then. Uh... i hand it over to aditi to close the session and also tell you what we'll do next week on saturday next week on saturday we'll again have janvi with us and she'll be in conversation with aditi uh, both of them being psychologists they will uh, exchange notes about uh, studying psychology in the india versus in the us and indian psychology as compared to western psychology and so on uh, that's what uh, we'll have next week but aditi will tell you more about it so that's exactly what we're going to do we will take this conversation further and specifically discuss about psychology as a career and how things come together so that the idea is not just restricted to psychology as an academic discipline but like in today's conversation as well to take it more and more as a way of life so it's more about like how she also said no it's not what you study but how you study so it's essentially what you know but how you apply that so that is the idea for us to make more and more uh, bridge building sort of things in what we know and how we apply it in our life so that will be our exploration for the next saturday so today we can just uh, close with few seconds of silence and janvi thank you once again for joining us today and we look forward for another conversation next week thank you everyone for uh, joining us just few seconds of silence and we close <laughs>